Hello and welcome to the Japan Zoomina at UC San Diego. And let's see, I can forward this. Yes, I'm Ulrike Schader. I'm the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology at the University of California in America's finest city, as they say. We are at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. GPS is an international relations and public policy school with a focus on the Pacific Rim and global matters. We do have an MIA, Masters of International Affairs, with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our programs, please visit gps.ucsd.edu. And at GPS, we have JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology, a Japan Center for Research, Education, Information, and Connections across the Pacific. If you'd like to know more about our Japan Center, please jfit.ucsd.edu. Uh, I also have my own website where uh, I post a blog and uh, newspaper articles and other matters of current interest. And in fact, our speaker today has a guest blog on uh, this website. So if you're interested in uh, more on this topic, please go there. Uh, before I start, let me just, and while people are still filing in, let me just uh, give you a little bit of a forecast of what we're going to do uh, in the next couple of weeks. The Japan Zoominar is a weekly event. Uh, it is every Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. California time, uh, which is Wednesday mornings in Tokyo. Uh, today, of course, we're going to talk about companies going global. Next week, uh, if you're interested in business matters, uh, take a note, we'll got it. we're going to have Kas Toyama, the CEO of IGPI, who is probably the, or maybe one of the, uh, most important business reformers in Japan right now. He has turned around JAL, he has turned around uh, Kanebo and a number of other places. He has started then his uh, own consulting company and he will talk to us about what's going to happen within Japan after Abenomics. Uh, we'll then turn to policy matters and um, interesting issues such as working women in Japan. Um, after the election, we'll have a round table on US-Japan relations. So please stay with us uh, and you can find past events and future ones on our website, jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zoominar. And today, of course, we have David Chet Chetwin. And so let me stop my share here and uh, welcome uh, Chet. Thank you, uh, Chet, welcome. You're in North Carolina, uh, so it's late for you. It's great to have you. Yes, um, thank you. So let me introduce you real quick, and then we're going to turn to your, to your PowerPoint. So, so Chet Chetwind is the CEO of JMNC Solutions. Uh, he's also the founder of Set, of Set Place. Uh, he's founded this company as an advisory firm for businesses that are interested in operating with or in Japan. And he brings to this business a very special background. He's earned his BS in uh, the University of Virginia, an MBA, an MBA at uh, UNC. You're, you're a rally guy, aren't you? Uh, yes, right. North Carolina. Uh, he then spent 14 years with Hitachi. Uh, he started out with Hitachi Data Systems, HDS, which is now known as Hitachi Ventara. And uh, Chet was in charge of strategy, and he was a VP strategy indeed, uh, helping Hitachi set up Mentara in the United States. So that has given you 14 years of working for one of Japan's most important companies and doing that at a time when that company made one of its most important changes in terms of turning global. So Chet, it's terrific to have you here with us. We look forward to your insights on um, how to read Japanese global business today, what we want to look at, how we want to understand it, and why it is so uh, interesting and important. So welcome to the show. Chet. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me on the show. Good morning to our audience in Japan. Uh, good afternoon for the United States. And uh, if you're watching from Europe uh, live, then I am sorry, because <laughs> it's the middle of your night. Um, so I think you covered my background really well. Um, so I am gonna launch into the slides here and uh, just go over the agenda real quick.
All right, here we go. So uh, this is gonna be a lot of back and forth because Ulrike and I, we only met uh, a few months ago, but we've had a lot of really interesting dialogue about Japanese business. I think we're both very passionate about it. Uh, I've read your book and thought it was wonderful. So uh, it's led to some really interesting conversations. And of course, this is just a continuation of that. So um, what we're gonna cover today, uh, and I think you'll hear a lot from both of us on this, is the big picture. I'll do this briefly, because I know that lots, lots of folks already have this down. Uh, Japan's economic position and the, basically the global economy. Um, how is Japan doing with global business? So there's a couple of things that we can look at, uh, both from uh, very large company data, like in the Forbes um, 500, Fortune 500 and Forbes 2000, uh, or we can also look at just the footprint of, of Japanese companies in the U.S. and see what's here and what industries they're in and, and where they sit and talk about how they can uh, survive and thrive into the future. So we'll do that in section two. And I think during that section also, Ulrike will talk a lot about the reforms that have been taking place in Japan. And so what's kind of driving some of this shift that we see with Japan's uh, behavior in global markets. And then finally, we'll spend some time on considerations going forward. So with that, let me just launch right in. And again, I, I won't take too long on this, but. Agnes Madison was a uh, sort of a combination historian and economist, and he put together basically the chart of accounts for every economy from the year zero to uh, 20, 2008, I believe it was. Uh, so really interesting work. And when you look at output per capita over that period of time, it's a pretty flat curve from the year zero to 1800, because what you could do with your hands was basically what you contributed to the output of the country, and then you'd multiply that by population, and voila, you have your GDP. Then something began to change in uh, around 1760 with the Industrial Revolution. And you know that brought in uh, new processes, new machinery. Uh, and of course, we've had different waves of innovation and disruption since then, including computers and the internet and robotics and AI. So what you see is that productivity increases dramatically as all of these new waves of innovation come online. Um, so I love this chart because uh, this is like a, a visual history of the world from an economic perspective. There's also lots of other considerations besides economics. We won't go too much into that today because it's, it's a, a business discussion. But um, what you see on the left-hand side of the white bar here is the uh, world powers GDP uh, by country. So China's in red, India's in orange, and so forth. And to the left of that line, you know, based on what we saw in that li linear uh, relationship to uh, GDP per capita, uh, GDP equaled population. And so this essentially tracks the population of those countries to the left of the white line. When you go to the right of the white line, you begin to see some shifting. And it's not that the population's changed in the way that you see here, it's that productivity changed. So uh, you see, of course, France was fairly large when the Industrial Revolution came about. Uh, they didn't benefit from this nearly as much as say Germany and the UK and the United States. And the United States saw an even bigger boost because it also had massive immigration. So the, the country essentially grew uh, to the size that it is today during this, uh, this period to the right of the white line. Uh, so the population combined with the high productivity led to a large share of global GDP. What began to happen in around 1990, 2000, is that uh, countries like Japan and, and uh, sorry, countries like China and India began to pick up uh, in terms of their productivity as well. And so you can see that China is now beginning to grow as a proportion of world GDP and that's because their productivity is increasing. So the numbers just to the right of this chart represent, let's say that the US is indexed at 100, China's productivity is 26. Japan's is already 66, so it's a fairly developed economy. Uh, like the US, it has quite a bit of, uh, of um, you know, efficiency, but uh, of course there's always more to go. Um, what's interesting about this wave of technology versus the Industrial Revolution is that things like software and IP transfer and spread much faster than industrialization, right? So um, you just see that there's a much faster rise in China than, uh, than perhaps you would have seen in the industrial uh, revolution because things don't move as quickly. So that's the phenomenon that we're dealing with, with here. And that's very important for Japan because as you can see, Japan has been relatively flat during this time frame, starting in the 19, 
60s, well, 50s and 60s, they grew, 70s, they grew, 80s and 90s, but then after that, things started to slow down and flatten. And so what does the future hold? And we'll talk about that. Well, you could also, if I could just add one thing, I mean, if you, so Japan is the 10th largest country in the world, but it is the, what, third largest economy in the world. So right. for our topic, that surplus has to be, you know, earned somewhere else, right? So right. Uh, we, are, we are going global. So that chart explains that too, actually. So uh, by the way, uh, audience, we're doing something a little bit different here. We're going to co-present uh, co these, these slides. Um, if you want to get your Q's and A's in, uh, the, as always, there's a Q&A button. And so feel free to start typing and I'll see that I, um, I'll tie you into our conversation here. So go, go ahead, Chad. All right, thank you. So this next one compares the economies of five countries over time. This comes from uh, JCER, which is the Japan Center for Economic Research. It's a, a government group. And uh, they forecast the economies out to 2060. I didn't include a forecast that far out because I think forecasts that go that long are a bit silly. Uh, I think COVID demonstrates that because this is already a, you know, a post-COVID economy and this is a pre-COVID forecast. So um, you would see a dip in this if it was the post-COVID forecast. But in any case, for the purpose of our discussion, what you see here is that uh, you know, consistent with the last slide, the US has the largest economy. Uh, China is rising quickly. It surpassed Japan in 2010 and could surpass the United States by 2030 on the trajectory that it's on. Um, what's interesting to note is just how flat Japan is during all of this. And so that raises some questions about with a shrinking economy, how does, the, how does this line stay flat? So we'll talk about that. And, and the, third, uh, the third paragraph here really gets to that. So drivers of, pro of productivity are software, algorithms based on data, uh, computing, autonomous machines. So these are all things that you'd find in Japan's government priorities, industry priorities. Uh, this is what Japan recognizes that they need in addition to you know, some advances in healthcare due, in, due to an aging population. But these things are very important for keeping that ec economic line flat as opposed to in, uh, into more severe decline. So let's look at how Japan is doing. Um, like I said in the introduction, there's a couple of ways that we can measure this. One is to take a look at some of these annual lists that are put out. Uh, so the Fortune Global 500 uh, has been coming out for quite some time now. And so uh, I track that over uh, many years. And you can see the Japanese companies, there were 148 Japanese companies in 1995 out of the global Fortune 500. That's an enormous proportion, right? So Japan was uh, at one point the number two economy in the world. Um, it has been surpassed by other economies that are growing faster. I think the rate that an economy grows has an impact on how many companies that you have just by virtue of size, uh, but it's been declining. But what you can see on the right-hand side of that chart is that it's really flattened out at around uh, 54, 53 companies in, in the top 500. And um, you know that's really maybe not what people expected to see, perhaps the beginning of an inflection point, but I think certainly it's a result of some of these uh, you know, policy decisions, uh, abonomics and so forth, that have really made Japanese companies uh, you know, begin to be more competitive on the global stage in, in different industries. They're obviously very competitive in some already. So I, you know, as you know, I read this chart a little differently. Uh, the one on the left where there are fewer global 500 companies from Japan over time could also be an expression of this anti-diversification, right? So Japanese companies used to be these huge conglomerates, uh, Hitachi being one of them, by the way, uh, that have now started to do what is called choose and focus, right? So to, to, under, to, to, to uh, identify core businesses, and then focus all the resources on these core businesses and sell off the rest. So if that's true, then Japanese companies should become smaller, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad development. Absolutely, and we did see that with Hitachi. So their revenue used to be 100 billion and they've engaged in I think some very effective choose and focus and now it's closer to 80 billion, but that 
I think is a much stronger company with with higher profit and a, a better future roadmap. So absolutely, uh, this could could well be uh, partly that. I do think though that when you think about you know huge companies like you know Microsoft, Amazon, Google, um, that's not a choose and focus thing. Those are enormous companies that are based on you know high tech and rapid adaptation to markets, and so those companies are there. They keep getting bigger, and and we're not seeing new companies like that from Japan entering the list uh, quite as often. But um, I I do agree that there's some choose and focus there. On the right hand side, uh, it's just another data point that uh, sort of reinforces this. It's the Forbes Global 2000. And so this is now the top 2000 largest companies by revenue. And we see the same sort of pattern is that the Japanese companies just over, like I did data over the last five years. And again, it's relatively flat um, over that time period. And so we're not seeing this this uh, you know horrendous decline in Japanese presence in, in uh, these top lists, they're actually doing quite well. And this is at a time when China is occupying more and more spots in these lists. I know in the Fortune 500, uh, Japan dropped fewer spots than the US did over the last five years. So they're, you know, there's an argument to say they're doing well. So one last thing on this uh, Fortune 500 data, I broke it down by segment as well. So for the 50 some Japanese companies that are in the top 500, um, this is an, a representation of those companies by industry. So it gives us a good idea of those large companies, what industry they're in. So you don't see like the, uh, you know, internet data centers and internet services here. But what you do see, of course, is auto and truck manufacturing. And this is one of Japan's, if not Japan's largest industry. Uh, out of the bar that you see there uh, for auto and truck manufacturing, I believe it Toyota, uh, Toyota makes up half that bar and is in fact the largest automotive manufacturer in the world. So uh, it's clearly a big area of strength for Japan. Um, another one that came as a surprise to me was, uh, doesn't, I'm not surprised that they're so large, the trading companies, but that they've grown so significantly. And of course this is averaged across many trading companies. So some grew more than others but uh, they have a, a larger percent increase in revenue than any other category on this list. So um, I think that's what caught, well, that among other things is what caught Warren Buffett's attention, right? <laughs> so um, enough with the Forbes and Fortune 500 lists. I wanna shift gears to what it is that is making Japanese corporations change. Uh, and Ulrike, you wrote the book on this. Uh, and so I think this would be a great topic for you to jump into. I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this slide. Well, so, so one of the questions that we're interested in, right, is the, tying these together is like, so, so here's Japan, uh, lots of global business, and we'll see more in a moment, but you'll show this, and yet, they're still doing business the Japanese way, right? And yet, you know, is it changing? Is it not changing? So that's those are part of the questions that, that we're interested in. My interest in the book, of course, was about this choose and focus thing. So what has brought about this strategy change by Japanese companies, right? And there are a number of reasons that you've put together here in this slide. Thank you for that. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see the, um, the, the shareholder structure of listed Japanese companies. And so we need to be careful when we read this chart because this is actually all listed Japanese companies and there are many, like 3,000. And so this is an average over 3,000 companies. Some of, half of them are actually pretty small. So the reality is much more polarized than this chart. So what we see is that in 1990, which is basically way back in the bubble, um, foreigners held something like 7% of Japanese companies followed by so-called trust banks or something tiny. Uh, and today, you know, you go all the way back to 2019, you see that foreigners and these trust banks, which are actually institutional investors, hold half of Japanese listed companies. Now, in reality, the trust banks and foreign, foreigners actually hold maybe 75% of the largest company like the Toyotas and the Canon and Panasonic and so forth of the world. And, and then for the smaller companies, the corporations and the domestic banks are still larger shareholders and this indicates. But so if you zoom in on the large companies like the JPX 400 companies, what we have here is a completely different incentive structure where the investors, the foreigners and the trust banks 
want returns on investment. They want profitability. They want, you know, show me the money. They want uh, productivity increases. They want technology leadership, right? And so the CEO of a Japanese company in the old days was a person that would cater to other Japanese corporations and Japanese banks and the Japanese government. And he would be a good um, connector and basically do what everybody wanted them to do. The CEO of a, Jap of a successful Japanese company today is a person that has a vision on how these Japanese companies can compete globally, which is our topic today, of course, right? And so uh, you observed this when you were at Hitachi with Nakanishi-san kind of going in and saying, we're going to do this differently now. And, and he's one of these representatives of this new global sort of, we can't just putter along and do be all kinds of things to all kinds of people and build trains and nuclear power plants and all of that, we have to choose, we have to focus, we have to, you know, push this ahead. And then on the right hand side here, we have a number of reasons that made this much more urgent recently. Uh, the rise of China. Uh, so China basically ate the lunch of these Japanese companies that used to own our living room. Um, the, the domestic issue of Abenomics, you know, why was Abe? so curious around, you know, so, so, so active about, you know, we need to increase profitability and we need to increase this. And part of this is that, that Japan sits on a lot of government debt and a lot of pension money and both are partially invested in the stock market. So, so <laughs> the Abe administration is very interested in earning higher returns on these stock holdings so that they could, you know, keep the pensions afloat. And they did this then through some indices. I don't want to hog too much of your time here, but, but basically the message of this slide is there were a large number of domestic pressures also that pushed Japanese CEOs, at least the ones that wanted to be more global, to become more global, right? And so what we have here is a very interesting point in time where what I call, you know, the reinvention happens, where, where the, the JPX 400 companies are saying, okay, look, we've got we've to do something. We can't just, you know, sit here twiddling our thumbs while the world is, is doing things much more, you know, globally. So I'll hand it back to you and, and, and let, let you tell us how exactly that's playing out. Yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this portion of the book. I mean, I was heads down in Silicon Valley when all this was happening in Japan and really wasn't aware of how all the pieces fit together when I was sort of, you know, living it on the front lines. But uh, now looking back at some of the things that Nakanishi-san would say to us and, uh, you know, some of the initiatives that were coming out and some of the things that they were asking us to do in terms of leading by example and being a, you know, a, a change, a changing organization that could be pointed to as an example because that's so important in, in you know, sort of a Japanese change process. Uh, the pieces all fit together for me now so I can see much better through the rear view mirror what was happening than I could at the time. Um, so let's dive in to uh, the U.S. because I've, I've got some data on the U.S. that I think is really interesting. Uh, Japanese company revenue in the U.S. is about $450 billion. Um, and it's interesting to look at what industries that's in because again, as we think about the go forward position for Japan and what those things are that drive productivity um, and you know, how important that may be to, you know, to Japan's influence in the region, um, let's take a look at what they build and, and where they build and, and so forth. So um, I'd like to start by diving into manufacturing because you talk about that a lot in your book. Um, the, uh, the smile curve was something that I think you talked about there. And I'm really fascinated with that because, um, you know, manufacturing, I think, really uh, is an area where that's very applicable. Could you just kind of run through the smile curve quickly? Um, because it kind of sets the context for the manufacturing discussion. And uh, we don't have a slide on it. So could you cover that's it? That's fine. Yeah. So the smile curve is, uh, is something that's now in every single Japanese government uh, report and the pe good people of Japan say, oh no, not the smile curve again. But what's actually interesting is that Americans are not concerned with the smile curve. So, um, so what it is, is it, uh, Andrew Shi, the CEO and founder of Acer Computers, uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago, drew it at, you know, at the back of the nap on a napkin. And it was like um, the stage of production and the um, uh, operating margin. 
where is the money in the stage of production when you globalize a supply chain? And it's a U-shaped curve, meaning uh, that the money is made in the upstream in design and input parts. And the downstream, which is retail, call it Amazon or Best Buy or something like that. And then the assembly in the middle is actually at the bottom of the smile, which means it is you know, a very low margin business. And so the Japanese companies, of course, were all in the low margin business. They used to own our living room. They were low cost, high quality mass manufacturers of TVs and household goods and so on. So they were, you know, flat at the bottom of the smiley there. And, um, and so when first Korea and then Taiwan and China started to copy Japan's um, and maybe I'll do Japan actually at this mass manufacturing of electronic items and, and, and washer dryers and you know, and kitchen equipment. So the, the, the Japanese companies were slow to wake up to this reality because they thought we are an electronics company, we are a washer dryer company. But eventually the reality set in that in order to compete uh, against China with the rise of China and, and having lost that competitive advantage and in consumer end products, these Japanese companies had to move up the smile curve into input parts, components, plastics, materials, um, things that go into things. Now there's no label on your computer, but you know the, three, the screen that you're looking at with a 0.8 probability has a very important Japanese input part. And so, um, so that's the smile curve. So now uh, back to you. I mean, so how does that play into this, this manufacturing chart here? Yeah, so let's dive down into manufacturing and see uh, it's 40% of Japan's revenue in the US. Um, and here's how it sort of uh, you know, distributes across the US. Um, I'll start with the left-hand side. The left-hand side is another one of these MECO maps or tree maps that shows that revenue, the 175 billion broken out by sub uh, markets of, of manufacturing. So transportation equipment, chemicals, et cetera. Um, and those colors on the MECO map correspond to the colors on the US map on the right hand side. So the orange transportation equipment and the orange dots on the map represent where the transportation equipment manufacturing is. The red represents where plastics manufacturing is and so forth. So the first thing that jumps out at me uh, when looking at this slide is that there's an incredible concentration of manufacturing from Michigan down to Alabama and then curving up into Virginia. Um, and also, uh, you know, when you look at what that, what uh, segment that's composed of, the majority is transportation and equipment. So clearly uh, a big automotive, uh, you know, manufacturing presence there. And the other things around it, like plastics and, and chemicals are, you know, in many cases, inputs to those manufacturing processes as well, and maybe even critical parts of those supply chains. So um, this is all areas that are going to have to compete as uh, markets disrupt. And I think we're seeing some good reactions by Japanese companies. So for example, uh, Hitachi, uh, it may have been a year or two ago, divested Clarion, which was owned by Hitachi Automotive. And then they, uh, they came to an agreement with Honda to, to merge the three uh, part suppliers for Honda into a joint venture, which will be now a a $17 billion automotive parts supplier. So this was done to, to react to the fact that it's not about making the best parts for an internal combustion engine. It may be about making completely different parts entirely. So uh, there's more strength in these companies together to sort of fight that fight as a unified group than there would be if they were all competing with each other uh, to, to sort of represent Japan's position and strength in the auto parts space. So. Again, a, a proactive move and uh, something that I think is going to benefit them in the long term. So here's a data point that some of you may be unaware of. Uh, Japanese automakers produce more automobiles in the United States than the big three U.S. car makers. And they hire over 1.5 million workers in these plants. And of course, this goes back a little bit to the trade wars, right, of, uh, of the 1980s when the U.S., uh, issued the uh, voluntary export mm -hmm. restraints and Japanese car companies had to voluntarily no longer export. And so that brought a lot of these 
factories over here and they are growing. And I, I like this observation very much that they're not just sitting there and just doing same old, same old, right? They're there um, because also they can uh, learn, they can bring in new technologies, they can build the next electric vehicle and they, they can build new plants, brand new plants that are even more efficient. We have a question actually from Anne who wants to know whether uh, energy uh, is part of this. I mean, the, so the, the parts that go industrial energy related tech exports, are they part of the story? Do you, do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, I, they might be in other manufacturing. Uh, when we get to the next slide, we'll see whether energy is a category in that. In fact, I'll flip there now to see if we can answer this question. I don't see energy as a different category outside of manufacturing. So maybe it's process manufacturing under that category, but it must have been so small that it was in the other category. So. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, so what she's talking about is basically my smiley curve thing, right? So you might see an energy plant or you might have a, you know, a, a local energy company, but some of the technologies that are a very envir pro environment uh, that make for more efficient plants and, and energy generation and hydrogen generators and so forth are actually made in Japan. And they're, I think they're part, I think my question to answer my answer to Anne's question would be, yeah, I mean, that's a, a, actually a very good example of this. There's no Japan Insight label, but a lot of what we use there is actually technology where some Japanese company is somewhere is part of this, has an aggregate niche strategy where they have this niche where they, are, they control a part of, of, that, of that global industry. Right. So let's zoom in. Are these the trading companies that you're talking about here, Chet, or is this something else? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's, it's both. So it's trading companies and companies uh, that simply, you know, are in a particular business and have a manufacturer, or sorry, a, a distribution presence in the US. So it's a little bit of both. Um, I was when I put this data set together, I was expecting to see the trading companies as enormous bars sitting at their headquarters. But then um, the way that I did this data set was I didn't show the revenue of holding companies so much as of all the uh, component companies so that you could get a better idea of where the activity is really taking place. So we don't have any enormous bars here for the big hold, uh, uh, trading companies because their revenue is sort of distributed among all their pieces. Um, but the purple does represent trading companies uh, for sure. It's just that it's very well distributed across the map. So your map is getting a lot of commentary here. Uh, let me just, uh, for, there's a clarification question. What year does this pertain to? This is um, not one year only. So this is data that uh, has been curated over a, a number of years. And because uh, I don't have a big enough team to keep it completely current, <laughs> I'd love to say it's all 2019 data, but um, I, I can't keep up. And so it's, uh, it's probably 2017, late 2017 to you know, early 2020 data. So, um, it's directional, but not precise. I can't say that it's one particular year. Okay. Um, so, but it's recent. I mean, it's, it's like basically oh, yeah. now, yeah, or, yeah. you know, just last year or something. Okay. Right. Great. Uh, so the other, the other thing I wanted to demonstrate with this picture is I've made manufacturing light gray here so that it would kind of fade into the background so that we would get a good picture of what the other portions of Japanese business in the U.S. are. And so we've talked a little bit about the trading companies, but what surprised me was how small some of the other sectors are. So, you know, finance and insurance, retail trade, um, you know, uh, information and professional services. They're there, but obviously not so big. And I think that based on, you know, Japan looking to uh, get into, you know, robotics and AI and these sorts of things that you would expect to see some services capabilities and, and more information capabilities. So uh, these are things that will need to grow and we'll talk later about how, but uh, they're, they're just not enormous footprints today, uh, but they are big enough to sort of be a beachhead. Although, I mean, if I were a, a cutting edge AI person, I would probably keep that at home rather yeah. than give it away at Silicon Valley, right? So there, there, there's also some strategy around this, right? So what are we doing in the United States and what are we doing in China? And in fact, we actually have a question of, of how this ties into the global supply chain. 
right? So Shujiro wants to know, well, you know, I mean, is this really, what, what does this really mean? I mean, isn't it, isn't it a story about how we're a semiconductor company and our client, our end client is maybe American, but we're first selling to Taiwan and then it goes from Taiwan to China and then it ends up in the United States. So how, how do we match your maps with this whole globalization of supply chains? Uh, with a very large team. <laughs> so th this represents revenue on the ground in the United States. You'd obviously have to track the uh, global supply chains and look at value added at each step. And so it'd be about the flows of, uh, of products from one country to another, how much value is added, how much markup there is as it transfers to a new place. And so very complex analysis. Um, I, I don't have that one for you today, but it's a great question. I, I would love to see it. Maybe someone else can take that on. <laughs> oh, I would love that too. I would be a research paper as well, actually. Yeah. 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 If, we um, could, if we could measure that, that, that would be amazing. Yeah. 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 So uh, anyway, the final point on this one, and it kind of tees up the next section, is uh, a Japanese company's ability to um, respond to market shifts and to industry shifts and that sort of thing. Uh, it relies on a lot of factors. So one, how and when was the entity formed? So really, what's the culture of that company in the United States? Uh, has it been around for 30 or 40 years? What's the content of local expertise in that company? Uh, and what's the tone being set by leadership in Japan? We've already talked about that, right? You have to have a friendly environment for, uh, uh, for reforming a business. And if you don't have that kind of air cover, then it's not going to happen. So the tone has to be set in Japan. Uh, and I think really critically important is that as long as you're in a business that has some localization requirement, and I think you know software is something that really fits into that category, then you need a lot of local capability to understand the market dynamics, how those interact with a culture. Um, you, know, you, you really need leadership in place that, that knows the market well. So we'll talk about that later too. So final section here is considerations going forward. And this is the toughest slide because now we talk about the difficult problem of how does uh, Japan do this balancing act as they go out into global markets. And I've seen the, the, um, the difficulties that occur at the intersection of Japanese and, and US management where I was in my position where there was just a fundamental difference in priorities. And, Again, I don't think my Western MBA prepared me for this, but the priorities are literally entirely different. And when you peel back the onion on, on some of the issues that I was facing, it came down in some cases to the, the fact that in the US, we prioritize shareholder rights and return on, on uh, equity and that sort of thing. And then in Japan, the number one priority is concern for employees. It really goes that deep. And, and it has a lot to do with history because Japan has had a long history of being a country with family companies. And of course, if you worked in a family company, I don't know, some families aren't that functional, but uh, <laughs> let's talk about a very traditional family company where uh, you took orders from the boss uh, who would be a member of your family and that person would be completely loyal to you as an employee and would never you know, cast you out of the company. And so there's this sort of reciprocal relationship between leadership and company members and that culture of a family uh, company really persevered through all of Japan's transitions. And even today, there's, that culture is foundational. It helps me understand why um, you know, lifetime employment is, is something that is so sacred. Now, there are a lot of things that are changing about that. I was actually at Kadenren in March. Uh, I was able to go to Japan just before the travel restrictions happened. And, uh, actually met with some folks at Caterin and talked about this. And it was a great conversation because they're fully aware of the fact that workers would love to be more engaged and, uh, you know, more empowered to do things. Um, but, uh, you know, these are probably the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of the reforms. And uh, my old friend Nakanishi-san is there uh, driving reforms at Caterin as well. So that's uh, really interesting to see. And I'm so happy to see it as well. Yeah, that's, the, that's the big change, right? So, I mean, if you had to, if you had to pinpoint, you know, what was the biggest change for this slide? 
I think it was when Nakanishi-san, who had driven the change in Hitachi and who has a vision for what the new Japanese companies look looks like, said he was willing to take over uh, the chairman position of Keidanren, which is the large uh, business umbrella association. And if and Keidanren was in charge of the hiring process and the sort of the finding the consensus of the large companies and they have completely changed, not completely, nothing ever changes completely, but they have somewhat changed the tune and the tone and the incentives in that system, right? So, um, so, so let's come back to this slide later because I want to ask you, uh, you know, what, one of the things that I find so fascinating is that even with all the globalization and all the $450 billion that Japanese companies generate in the United States, when they do business in the United States, they still do it the Japanese way, right? Well, uh, because it's largely manufacturing, I think that's an industry that um, that fits well with uh, the Japanese model. I mean, um, Mona Zikuri is is a great fit for manufacturing, and and they brought it to the U.S. back to the U.S. Let's say, and uh, it is uh, it's going quite well. I think it's when you look at other industries that we begin to see the real friction, where you know Japan is just maybe not on the cutting edge of, of uh, you know, software application development or, you know, internet data centers and cloud services. So, you know, these are, these are where um, I think a new set of, of rules need to come into play with respect to, you know, you, you can't just keep everything from, from Japan and have it work out in the global market. There has to be more of a hybrid management approach. And, and when I work with the, the CEOs that are my clients, uh, we talk a lot about what's the best hybrid management approach for your particular situation. Um, you know, and, and it leads to another thing. Driving change is such a sensitive issue. And I, I really like the thing in your book, the, uh, the two out of three characteristics that one could exhibit. So um, I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, be polite and considerate, be appropriate, and don't rock the boat. So when I started at Hitachi Data Systems, uh, I got some training on how not to rock the boat. And, you know, we all understood what we shouldn't do uh, if we were to, you know, maybe upset anyone in the least bit. Um, but after the training, we're like, geez, we actually kind of need to rock the boat in this case because we're in Silicon Valley and we're competing in a very fast paced environment. Um, this is an area where if we don't rock the boat, we don't think that we'll survive. So we lived by the two out of three rule. We, we tried to be polite and considerate and appropriate most of the time, but uh, we, we took our demerits on rocking the boat. And um, yeah, it was, it was a great rule that I think you, you came up with there. Well, I think that's right, right? Because, uh, because that's the only way change can ever happen in a tight culture. You know, somebody has to get the permission to do something that is a little bit different. And as long as you kind of fit in still and you're polite, or, so, you know, so appropriate refers to you know, green hair or, you know, sort of show up, you know, with, with a, you know, looking different. People would say, no, that's not appropriate. We don't, we don't dye our hair green. And so you can't show up and work with green hair. But if you're polite and you're otherwise never causing any may work or any, any inconvenience, maybe you might even get away with that today. Right. But you can't violate more than two. That would be a reason to, you know, it would not be the way Jap Japan does business. But I think, by the way, your, your observation is, is spot on. I think that the Japanese business culture is fantastic for the Toyota production system. Right. It works really well. Everybody is sort of doing it really well. They're paying attention. They're very conscientious. It's de detail oriented. It's make no mistake. It's, it's Anzen Daiichi, right? Safety first, it's uh, quality first. And that fits really well, it's including lifetime employment and, and, and lockstep promotion, right? But when right. you need to develop a cutting edge technology, that culture becomes very complicated. This risk right. averse sort of, oh, you know, we have to do it by process will probably not work. So, so that is the, maybe the core pressure for Japanese companies right now at this moment, because they have to operate in the United States differently. When the days where they just make cars in the United States are over, right? Yeah, yeah. It's going to take a lot of empowerment of leaders, uh, you know, outside of Japan. And unfortunately, the word empowerment 
doesn't exist in the Japanese language. So you have to spell it with katakana, it's in pawamento. Um, and the concept is just not there. The idea that you would uh, take your authority and uh, you know, give it to someone else to work on your behalf. There is, there's transfer of authority, but there's not empowerment in the, in the sense that we think of it. And so, uh, you know, it's just, it's just fascinating when you have, uh, that's a guy Raigo, and uh, a word from the outside. And the reason they don't have the word empowerment is that the concept is just a little bit uh, difficult um, to- so, uh, so in Japanese, it's empowermento? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that means nothing. Right, right. Yeah. We might think we're getting something across if we say it that way, but it still doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right. It's like corporate governance. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, now, th this is another thing that I learned uh, looking back. So um, when Nakanishi-san was driving some reforms at Hitachi in the, you know, the 2015 time frame, one of the things that he had uh, espoused at the time was um, autonomous, decentralized global management. And I'm thinking to myself, that's empowerment. Why are you using so many words to describe it? Well, now I have my answer is that the concept wasn't there. And so in order to get this across as sort of a, uh, you know, a change initiative and a, you know, a, a, something that people should really be paying attention to, it had to be described in some detail. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Hitachi? Yeah, so actually that's a great tee up for the next slide. So, you know, I think it's a great success story in that, um, you know, Hitachi Data Systems started as a very small distributor of Hitachi's mainframes back in 1989. By 1999, uh, Hitachi had taken full ownership of HDS. And by 2007, they had brought uh, a lot of their people there uh, to Silicon Valley. Uh, they, you know, sort of infused a lot of the, the culture that was there into, into what we were doing. Uh, and it became a great blend of both cultures. In 2007, I think this is a great story and not many people know this, there was a, a disruptive innovation in the storage market that really came from the combination of the Japanese teams working collaboratively with their global go-to-market counterparts to understand customer requirements and competitive dynamics. So, so often, you know, great innovations in Japan are developed, but don't ever get to market because that's just not the strongest suit for global business. But in the case of Hitachi Data Systems and this innovation that came from the storage division in Japan, the combination of the two led to a, a great product portfolio and a, a, an incredible run for the business. So um, after that innovation came out, HDS made 10 plus acquisitions and really transformed itself from being a data storage company to uh, something that was just much bigger and more significant to Hitachi overall. And in 2017, they combined the things that have been acquired and, and built over time into something called Hitachi Vantara. Now, it's a really amazing accomplishment from a marketing perspective to have a company called a name that doesn't represent precisely what it does. Right, you've got Hitachi Chemical, Hitachi Construction Machinery, Hitachi Data System. What about if you have a company that's changing rapidly and driving into the digital era with new solutions across IT and operational technology and the internet of things? Uh, it's okay to give it a word like, you know, an Apple or a Google. So uh, it was, it was a, a fight, but, um, you know, arriving at Hitachi Vantara was, uh, you know, we thought a, a really good thing for Hitachi to just sort of have this global digital footprint. And today that company represents 9% of revenue and 11% of operating profit. When you look at Vantara combined with the uh, system and plat uh, service and platform division, I think it is in Japan. So um, just a, you know, kind of a demonstration of how you can really grow something very big and fast paced in a global market. And the key elements to that were having the air cover in Japan to, to do that, which was all the things you described that were happening in the background I wasn't even really aware of uh, with respect to you know, the, uh, you know, the index and the corporate governance reforms and uh, many other things that were really causing change. Uh, and of course, uh, Nakanishi followed by Higashi Harasan uh, really being champions of change as well. And so all of that resulted in, uh, in what we have today. And that's, uh, you know, maybe an example of how a hybrid approach can be effective.
and from a corporate governance perspective too, this is very interesting, right? Because there's this whole debate in Japan about the listed subsidiaries, which is a traditional thing that always existed because that's how you grew new business. And you, you know, that's how Fujitsu came into being and that's how Kano came into being. And that explains the large corporate shareholdings. So there is you know, some criticism that that's not okay. You know, a company shouldn't have a listed subsidiary. And so Hitachi, before this all started, maybe but at around 2000 or so, had 22 such listed subsidiaries. And today they have fewer than three. I mean, they're kind of basically just peeling it off, right? So there's this whole choose and focus again, where, where the chemicals and the forklifts and the, you know, and all of that is gone. Some very strategic acquisitions like the ABB power grid right. and the focus on becoming a data solution provider, right? Through Ventara, which is so, so interestingly named. How you, does, that, does it mean anything? Uh, it, it refers to a number of things. Yeah, I don't remember precisely what they are. <laughs> but uh, yeah, w w when we sold it, we uh, did have some. Uh, Things that compose the name, yeah. Um, so, so you know, Jitenda has a really cool question, which I would like to uh, to raise here with us and discuss. Uh, he, he, last week we had uh, uh, John Treat here, and we're talking about literature, and he was talking about the precarity that that is that imbues like Japanese literature. And Jitenda's questions goes in that direction, right? Uh, the, the, the Japanese companies often pretend as if they're constantly under siege. And they're, you know, it's precarious, you know, and it, 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 what, for whatever reason that maybe escapes us. But he wonders whether that's a strength or a weakness. And, and it could be a strength in the, in the Andy Grove sense of the world, right? Only paranoids, only the paranoids survive. And that we're so weak and we can't innovate and we can't do it. And then they do this, right? Uh, right. Or, any thoughts on that? Um, it may get a little bit to the you know the culture of manager and uh, and managee. So in other words, um, you know there's there's always it's like they're a, maybe a, a strict parent. So there's always this thought that you could do better. And so management kind of takes that tone is I'm not going to be you know very cuddly and warm to you, but I'm going to you know always tell you that you need to do better. And so uh, maybe that's what he's talking about with the constant struggle is that that's. That's the view that someone gets when they're looking from the bottom up the chain in a Japanese company. Um, you know, one thing that I noticed, I had some, some supervisors who were Japanese as I was working at Hitachi and I, I really liked and respected them, uh, but I would never expect compliments. And, and you know, that's just not part of the Japanese uh, style. So you have to be rather hardened to that and not expecting so many pats on the back um, if you're, uh, you know, if, if that's what fuels you. So again, it gets to understanding the differences and learning to uh, manage through them in an effective way. Uh, are you, do you have more slides or because we have a bunch of more questions? Uh, oh yeah, so let's maybe wrap this up and then I'll have a few questions before we, uh, we... Yeah, yeah, so this slide is a wrap up and it's an important one because a lot of the transformation that we've talked about has, has been related to M&A. So there is a, a dramatically increasing Japanese outbound acquisition trend. Uh, it's a little bit down in 2020, but I would expect a rebound. Uh, so that's very clearly on the upswing and uh, it just represents continued activity. Japan obviously has a lot of cash still that they could deploy for acquisitions. And as markets are down, it might be a good time for that. Um, Increasing numbers of large deals. So Takeda and Shire is one example of that, but there's other billion dollar plus deals. When you make a deal as large as the Takeda Shire deal, that's really a transformative acquisition. And so there's a number of ways that you can sort of change your culture globally. Uh, one is to do a transformative acquisition and the other is to just proceed with a string of pearls approach, which is more like what we did at Hitachi Vantara where we bought you know, one thing after the other and built it up into something over time. Uh, so both of the, those approaches work and they create very different management challenges, I think, when it comes to that intersection of Western and Japanese business. And so I think each could be, you know, we could spend a lot of time on that. But we, I think with that, I'll wrap it up and I wanna make sure we get to the Q&A. 
Yeah, so I've been weaving in. We've got great questions. And um, if we if we don't answer your question now, uh, we'll get to it tomorrow. We'll, we'll, look, at the, we'll look at all your Q&A and, and get in touch if we have, uh, you know, sort of uh, important things to say. Um, let's look into the future. So, so Anthony and Anne have all both asked, but what's, gonna, what's this going to be like under SUGA? And this is like the new normal, does it continue? And so let me just say, so for the domestic, you know, what's going to happen after Abe? Please dial in next week at 4.30 because we're going to have Kas Toyama here. And Kas Toyama sits on uh, these various reform committees. He works with METI. He works with the companies. He's in everybody's ears. So he will come in and talk about business reform after Abe. But what I want to ask you, Chet, because you're, you're kind of a you're software guy, right? So you're an IT guy. So you're at, you understand the, the heart of this digital transformation. And the digital transformation, I think, is a huge opportunity for Japan. Uh, we already talked with uh, Alberto Moel here on the shop floor and you know, sort of the Gemba reforms. Where, what do you see, where do you see the future of, of Japan and the tech space? I mean, supercomputing, AI, you know, quantum, you know, whatever. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about supercomputing might be your field more than some of these others. Yeah, yeah. So I blogged on supercomputing recently, and that's a really interesting one because there's a big news from Japan. It came out in, uh, I think it was mid to late June, uh, which would be, which would have been perfect timing to correspond with the Olympics. Unfortunately, that was delayed, but the supercomputer arrived, arrived right on time. Uh, Riken and um, Fujitsu built a supercomputer called Fugaku. And it is the fastest computer by far in the world. And not only is it the fastest beating Japan, or sorry, beating two of the US's major supercomputers as well, um, but it's also one of the most green uh, architectures. And so it ranked in the top 10 for the most power efficient computers. So it's great to be the fastest, it's great to be the greenest, but to be the fastest and the greenest both at the same time, or it's number eight for green, but that's a pretty big accomplishment, um, is, is really saying something. And so you have to look at that architecture and see if there's really something there. So this Fugaku supercomputer was built on ARM processors and it did not use NVIDIA GPUs, which is totally unique to the supercomputing space. And it would have been a slam dunk if it wasn't for the fact that SoftBank just sold uh, ARM to NVIDIA. <laughs> so, you know, while it was looking really brilliant to have built a supercomputer with no GPUs, uh, I would expect that NVIDIA might sort of over time migrate the roadmap towards being more inclusive of GPUs. But that's not to say that the effort is for naught because the number of computer scientists and software engineers and others in Japan at the universities and private, private industry who were involved in that project are going to spill out into other places and contribute to other advances in Japanese high tech. So I do expect that the project will you know, help tip the balance and that there's obviously a lot of initiatives around government training and AI and uh, you know, improving software education and, and applications of software. So it's an exciting time for Japan, for sure. Uh, and I, I really look forward to seeing what's coming. And I know we're almost out of time, but I've got to throw in robotics is another important area for Japan, right? Um, SoftBank owns Boston Dynamics, which is that uh, robotics company that everyone sees on the internet with the, uh, with the the dog and the humanoid robot that can walk over stones and that sort of thing. Uh, in the most recent one, the, the robot can do acrobatics. Well, that is all about um, replacing workforces in factories. Japan is the perfect company to apply that, or the perfect country to apply that because they have a declining population. So what better than robotics and AI to help fill some of those gaps? And the Japanese culture is very accepting of robots and, and uh, Americans less so. So it's, it's a great opportunity for Japan. Yeah, and uh, we could talk about this forever. You have a, a the, the blog that you allowed uh, me to to duplicate on on my website. 
is uh, shows the patents in AI and that Japanese companies are actually the world's leaders combined, uh, not the number one or number two, but in the top 10 of the AI patents, Japanese, Japan rules, right? And so whatever that may mean, it's in indicative that there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of push towards uh, innovation. And so um, you're right, Chet, we're out of time. So let me thank you uh, and let me read the slide out uh, for our audience. So uh, Chet Chetman is the founder and CEO of JMNC Solutions and you can find more about his blog and uh, the opportunities to work with him on his website, which is jmncsolutions.com. So thank you, Chad, for this uh, terrific uh, conversation. Thank you, audience, for a terrific set of questions that we will uh, re review and, and uh, respond to uh, as soon as we get, get those. And uh, let me close on announcing uh, next week's event, as I always do. This is not it, obviously. Uh, let me go forward. Um, we will have, as I just mentioned, uh, Kastoyama, and the uh, title is Japanese, Japan's Business Reforms After Autonomics. What to expect as we uh, look at Prime Minister Suga and uh, any changes in, in Japanese economics and business politics. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Chet. It was terrific. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, take care, everybody. Stay healthy and see you next week.